Alcohol is the solution to the problem, and it works until it stops working. Even though I had accomplished certain things as a swimmer and had sort of distinguished myself academically, I was still very much a navel gazer. You know, I couldn't talk to a girl. I couldn't, I just wasn't comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. I felt like, and you hear this in AA a lot, like everybody else had the rule book for life. And I was sitting on the outside, like marveling at how people seem to, you know, gracefully navigate the world where I just felt you know, anxious all the time. And alcohol solved that problem. Like I have a lot of love for it. Like mm -hmm. it, it gave me social tools that I lacked and taught me how to be a social animal in a social situation. Suddenly I could go to a party and, and crack a joke and flirt with a girl and do all these things that were beyond my capacity to handle prior to that. So it's not all bad, like it worked, you know right. what I mean? Which is why I doubled down on it. Right. Like the cure for alcoholism isn't removing alcohol. Alcohol is, is the solution to the problem and it works until it stops working. Mm. And it took a while before it stopped working in my case. Um, but the ism remains once you remove the substance. You can't blame anyone else. And it's not about anything external. It's only about your relationship with you. And you're still going to be, you know, impulsed by your innate biases and however your hardwiring has set you up to, you know, perceive the world. But you get that extra little moment of recognition to course correct, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I, you know, I would say that I've become you know, sober in '98. Uh, so I've been in this thing for a long time. And when I came in, I just thought, oh, it's drug addicts and alcoholics. That's what addiction is. But I've become convinced that addiction lives on this massive spectrum. And we are all victims of addiction on some level, some mm -hmm. mild and some extreme from, you know, the guy lying in the gutter with a bottle to the guy who can't pull the needle out of his arm to the compulsive scrolling while we're taking a sh you know, or the guy who, or the that one's woman deep. who- That one runs deep. <laughs> goes, yeah, who goes from bad relationship to bad relationship, sure. you know, repeating a certain pattern because there's something about that that they can't, there's a compulsivity to that that they can't control. So I think thinking about addiction more broadly makes it applicable and instructive and useful for people as they, develop enough self-awareness to have objectivity on how they maneuver the world and the daily habits that they continually find themselves, you know, falling prey to that are leading their lives in the wrong direction. And the impulse to addiction, this the way that we're wired, it doesn't have to all be bad because I knew someone, I, I dated her before I'm, you know, got with my wife and mm -hmm. her name is Maya and we actually did a podcast on gratitude. And what I found about her is she had a daily gratitude practice that was unbroken for seven years and she was addicted to mm -hmm. gratitude, like literally addicted to gratitude. Uh -huh. And it was amazing. She was such <laughs> yeah. a happy person. <laughs> yeah. She forged that addiction. But it is a practice, right? Absolutely. So it didn't come, she didn't necessarily wake up feeling grateful, nope. but by dint of, you know, her allegiance to that practice becomes that which she aspired to become. And it wasn't a, it was a 30 minute practice. Like it was wow. like a legit practice uh -huh. that she did. She had a whole curriculum that she developed and being grateful for different aspects of her life. And so that's possible with the same mechanism that drives people to all of the things that you mm -hmm. mentioned prior. The same mechanism can kick in and get you addicted to those things. The kind of final chapter in my alcoholism, just to disabuse everybody of any kind of romantic Bukowski notion of what it was like. Mm -hmm. I was not, you know, penning the great American novel or <laughs> doing anything creative. I was by myself. Um, drinking alone, often waking up in the morning and having a vodka tonic in the shower and working as a lawyer and trying to sneak drinks throughout the day. Like it was exhausting. It was, it was sad and lonely. Um, I had burned bridges with friends. I was unreliable. My parents didn't want anything to do with me. And, you know, ultimately um, I had a marriage that ended on the honeymoon. Like I had, a, you know, I created a lot of chaos and wreckage and destroyed a lot of relationships and just became, you know, a, a irresponsible, unreliable member of society living like two blocks from here, 
sleeping on uh, a bare mattress on the floor of a apartment with no mm -hmm. furniture and you know the phone wasn't ringing um i was i'd gotten two duis i was looking at possible jail time i was going to get fired from my job and just woke up one day you know after a bender and nothing particularly terrible had happened that night but i had kind of reached that nadir where i was like i can't do this anymore and i had been seeing an addiction therapist and he was like are you ready and he's like i got a bed for you and ended up going up to Oregon and checking into a rehab, uh, thinking I was gonna do a quick couple week spin dry because I was so important and I had to get back to my job. <laughs> and, uh, you know, had this epiphany, you know, coming to there that I, you know, my best thinking, I thought, oh, well, I'm a smart guy. I was literally, you know, institutionalized. And that landed on me like a ton of bricks. And I just realized like, I better figure this out because yeah. the future is not looking bright and started opening up and taking direction and, and listening and letting go of how I thought things should be. And for the first time was honest about the things that I was doing and the ways that I was behaving. And the, you know, I remember a counselor telling me like, you know, you have a case of alcoholism that we typically only see in like 65 year old men who come in here who have been drinking for the better part of their lifetime. And if you don't, if you don't get this, like you're, probably gonna die and he just said it so point blank like I'll never forget it and it scared the shit out of me so he said I think you, you I, I know that you think you're gonna spin out of here in 28 days but we think you should stick around and I just said I'll stay here as long as you think I should should be here and I ended up living there for a hundred days um, which is kind of a long time to be in rehab sure but that saved my life there's so much capability that resides within all of us and you know like yourself I've had the privilege of sitting across from so many people who've done extraordinary things and you see the humanity in all of them I and mean, we project this superhero quality onto all these people but they're all just human beings who had a dream and worked hard to achieve it and it's inspiring to really um, own and grasp the idea that that you know we're all sitting on top of deep reservoirs of, of, of potential that remain untapped and our job is to you know, figure out how to authentically, you know, connect with that voice um, that is telling us to, you know, unlock something and share it with the world. And if you can do that and then share that story and tie it in some way to service uh, as a teacher yeah. or in some way that can inspire other, other people or pave the way for a better world, I mean, that to me is the recipe for a good purpose-driven, fulfilling life. I'm much more focused on what I'm doing today and how I can, um, you know, leverage these tools that I've learned to ameliorate, you know, the disease as it as it rears its head and other kind of behavioral stuff. Like I don't, it's very rare that I would crave alcohol these days. Like sure. I don't think about it. It's been so long, but but I still have the ism, and that pops up in all kinds of ways and makes me an ass or resentful or frustrated or you know, grinding on this problem. Like we were talking when I walked in, like we're both enjoying amazing lives. Like we're very privileged to get to do what we get to do and meet these amazing people and support our families, you know, by doing it. Um, so why don't I wake up inherently grateful <laughs> every day? You know, and it's, it's like, that's what I use most of my mental energy trying to, you know, focus on. When you are telling yourself you know, that you got to keep going, you need to suffer more, because this is about suffering tolerance, mm -hmm. ultimately. You have to coach yourself, you have to be a good coach to yourself in this mm -hmm. process, because it is very, very much mental. What's your kind of inner monologue as the inner coach of yourself in these points where you need to push yourself through mm. the suffering? I think, for me, um, it's all about being present and comfortable with the discomfort. You know, I think if you get caught up in like, I gotta make it to here, or, you know, I'm thinking about some destination, then it detracts from your ability to get there because you can't get there if you're not anchored in the moment that you're actually in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what happens is time becomes very malleable. Like if I'm doing an eight hour ride and you're in this like suffering state of mind, you're not used to that it's going to feel like an eternity but when you build up to it like suddenly an eight-hour ride feels like a two-hour ride 
So there is a weird thing that happens with that that I think any endurance athlete would would recognize. But for me, it's just it's about being. It's always bringing myself back to the present moment. Yeah. And not trying to run away from it or distract myself from it.